Okay, all right, we're going to start here. Um, thank you all for coming to the Hudson Institute today. My name is Michael Pregent. I'm a senior fellow here at the Hudson Institute, and I'll be moderating today's panel on Syria. And we have with us uh, an, a panel of experts from across the region, starting all the way to my left, your right, is Bassam Barabandi, a former Syrian diplomat, co-founder of People Demand Change, and he is from Deir Azur, Syria. Then we have, to his immediate right, Matthew Brodsky, Senior Fellow, Security Studies Group. He just recently authored a piece with the Foundation for the Defense of Democracy, uh, Controlled Chaos and Escalation of Conflict Between Israel and Iran in War-Torn Syria. And a more recent report that is very uh, timely for this panel here, one on the financial viability of the Assad regime. And in that, you'll see a lot of ties to Hezbollah and Iran, and it's very uh, important as we look at a post-conflict Syria to see what Iran, Russia, Assad intend to do in Syria to include Hezbollah. To his right, Randa Slim, director of the Conflict Resolution and Track 2 Dialogues Program at the Middle East Institute. I had the fortune of being able to travel with her to Berlin to talk to some Russian think tank members on what to do in Syria, and we'll bring that up as well. And then to my immediate left, Charles Lister, who has seemed to grow three inches since the last time I saw him. Uh, it's good to see you, Charles. Senior Fellow and Director for Extremism and Counterterrorism Program at the Middle East Institute as well. So it's great to have you all. Thanks for, having, for, thanks for being here today. I'm going to start this off with a scene setter. So as we look at Syria, as of this morning, uh, we're looking at a Russian naval buildup. We're looking at the imminent attack of Idlib by Russian, Iranian, Hezbollah, and, and uh, Assad forces. Um, the United States has put out a warning. Don't use chemical weapons. So what does that really mean? It means you can use barrel bombs. It means you can use white phosphorus. It means you can use chlorine gas. Just don't use sarin, or we might launch cruise missiles. I know that's sarcastic, but it's actually been our policy for the last five years, unfortunately. Uh, we also have this talk of, of reconstruction, and that's what this panel will focus on. But reconstruction normally takes place in post-conflict societies, and we're still in conflict here. Uh, we have a NATO ally threatening another NATO ally, that being Turkey and the United States in, in northern Turkey. We have Russia and Iran working together, unless it's in the south, where Israel is allowed to attack IRGC Quds Force positions. We have the Russians and the, and the Iranians competing for reconstruction contracts and looking to the United States to provide the funding, looking to Europe to provide the funding. And so far, we've heard hard no's on that, and that's a good thing. So Syria. Syria is, has been going on now for almost seven years, and I don't know where we're at. And that's why we put this panel together here. We can actually have experts tell us where we're at. So with the news today of a Russian buildup, with an imminent attack on Idlib, with the United States trying to negotiate a way out of Syria by uh, putting pressure on Russia and Assad to get rid of the Iranians on the ground, I mean, where, where are we at? And I'll start with the person who's actually from Syria. Oh, my God. <laughs> I hope you start again. <laughs> Just make us smart uh, on this, because I don't know yeah, what's yeah, going on. No. Uh, thank you for having me, and thank you, everybody, to, to be here. Um, I don't know where to start, uh, but we, let's start by, by the reconstruction stuff. Uh, in order to make sense of the reconstruction, we have to imagine Syrian map as divided into three parts. Part that used to be, till now, the, under the regime control from 2011 till today, and the damage in that part is very minimum. Then the second part, which is revolutionary part, or was outside the control of the regime for 2011 till recently, is the destruction is more than 100%. And then we have the last part, which is the SDF control area, Jazeera area. It's, it's destructed, but it's in a way wealthy in the resources, and we have the US over there. Today, when the regime and Russia basically murdered the regime, they are talking about reconstructions, and they are hoping to bring all these refugees back. It's a way to get the money, but not to rebuild the destruction part, rather than to empower the part under the regime control area, because they need more services. They don't need infrastructure the way that other parts need, rather than they need to tell the supporter, we win, and now you enjoy the privilege of winning, that you get more school, more roads, more electricity, more water. 
with understanding that that part of Syria, till today, they don't have shortage of electricity, for example. Syria, till today, after all the distractions, uh, the regime controlled area, they have extra electricity, and they offer to sell it to Lebanon, and Lebanon say, we don't need it. Um, the water is still working, and so on and so forth. So today, I think most probably that uh, the regime and Russia, they need the money just to consolidate their power in the controlled area. When we talk about the, the area that the regime get it back, like Dara, Damascus, uh, and other area, the destruction is more than 100%. There is nothing. And till today, with all what the Russian called reconciliation, the people didn't come back the way they are mentioning. Uh, not from Jordan, not from Lebanon, not from Turkey, not from any other part. Because simply, there is there's no place to sit. There is no rule of laws. Uh, people in yesterday, the German foreign minister with an institution called HIL, H-I-I-L, they make studies and they say 65%, between 45 to 65% of Syria and Jordan and Lebanon are willing to come back if they have uh, stability, security and stability and their services. So the refugees themselves, they say, we will come back when we have this. And uh, Russia, they are trying to say, give us the refugee back in order to rebuild. So it goes in that circle. And here, the third part of Syria, which is the SDF controlled area, <laughs> the big damage was in the main cities of Deir Zor, Raqqa, and the line where it was occupied by ISIS. Whereas the more we go north, the destruction is much less. And this area, they have the oil, they have the all natural resources that doesn't need much outside sources to rebuild that country, especially the US forces are already there. Um, so for them, they have the more leverage to sell that oil and gas to the regime to get the money. Right. And here we back to the big picture of the US policy towards Syria, what we do with this complexity. From one side, the United States is supporting SDF 100%. At the same time, the SDF is working with the regime 100%. Um, and that area where there's clashes or control between uh, control lines or front lines between what we call the regime and SDF, uh, we show, we did a map at peopledimensions.com, uh, where are pro Iranian militia? The Iranian militia are all around US forces. So basically, in theory, in reality on the ground, that any support the regime will take from SDF as natural resources will empower Iranian forces on that line to attack the SDF and the Americans. We'll get back to the... So I'll stop here. Yeah. We'll go back to it. Randy, you want to say something? Well, I just want to build on what Bassam has said in terms of, and in responding to your question about where are we in Syria. And I think we need to think about it along three tracks. There is a military track in Syria. There is a political track, negotiation track in Syria. And then there is the economic reconstruction track in Syria. And if we look at the Syrian regime and you know, the forces that support, uh, the countries that supported primarily Russia and Iran, they have a very clear, comprehensive strategy about how these three tracks fit with each other. And, and, they, are, and they have a clear objective, which is basically restoring the Assad regime and regaining territorial integrity of Syria. If we look at the United States, if we look at the opposition, if we look at you know, other actors, uh, the group of five or six who are invited now to the uh, meeting on September 14 uh, with Dimistura, we don't have that kind of comprehensive approach to, uh, and there is a, 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 there is a, how to say, a muddied objective. Uh, for the first time in a long time, yesterday we heard from General Mattis and Joint Chief uh, Chairman, um, Dunford uh, re, um, re emergence. We are hearing again the talk about a political process that leads to a government that is not led by Assad. We haven't heard this talk in a long time. And suddenly it is appearing, you know, and it has to do with some of the debate that are going in the administration. So is this now the new objective again, or is this the old new objective, you know? Because at some point I felt that that objective has been discarded uh, aside to the idea of elections, constitutions, whatever. So on the political track, if we look at Russia, especially having come from a US-Russia dialogue, I think there is definitely a, they see Geneva as leading as a, through the only lens of establishing a constitutional committee that will uh, involve uh, some opposition, uh, the regime, and that will agree on a set of constitutional amendments that are likely to be cosmetic in nature. And however, 
Uh, uh, and then eventually they see a political process that will include elections to ratify, legitimize this outcome of cosmetic constitutional amendments. And then, you know, looking back at the international community, use that process to say, you know, the people of Syria have spoken. This is the time now to start putting money into reconstruction and refugees. So I'll stop at this point because I have some also something to say about why Russia is pushing this issue of refugees. And, and it's much more nuanced in terms of, of what's driving them uh, than it has been discussed to date in um, analytical reports of that. So quick question on refugees, just a quick question. Will they decide who gets to come back, meaning more Sunni Arabs won't be able to come back. Is there a resettlement like we've seen with Iran's strategy in the past where they actually move in Shia families, Shia militias, people from Afghanistan, people from Iraq, into these areas? We've talked about this in the past. So is this refugee thing, under the title refugee, what we're really talking about is preferred refugees and not necessarily the ones that need to come back in order for there to be a balance. So when you say the Syrian people in the future, you're talking about vetted Syrian people, of selected of Syrian people, not the people that have left that want to come back. They're not allowed to come back. Is that is that? I fair? mean, the best example is what's happening with the refugees coming back from Lebanon. You know, what one count I heard, three thousand applied, three hundred were allowed. So, right. and 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 where they allowed to go? I think uh, the demographic, the new demographic map of Syria, is right. something that the regime would like to live with for the foreseeable future. It's a map that they it's need all to comfortable cosmetic, with. cosmetic it's, that it's, favors uh, the Assad so, regime. So it's a it's a map that they are comf comfortable with. And, 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 and Russia is not going to be as much on the ground looking at you know, each of these refugees. I think the, the work with refugees on the ground is going to be done more by groups like Hezbollah, by the Syrian regime uh, you know, security services, uh, whereas Russia is not going to be involved as much in the vetting that you are talking about right. and, and will be able to claim to the international community ex-refugees have come back. Russia is more interested in the numbers game. It's right. not in who returns as much as one million returned. Right, because right. that's something that it can take back to the EU and say, look, one million have returned. They need health services. They need right. schools. They need roads. They need sewage systems. We need money to do that because Russia does not have the money. Right. That's, that's now the conundrum facing Russia. It understands fully well that the way forward is to, for as far as Russia is concerned, is to get as many refugees back, and they need to proceed with reconstruction, but there is no money that Russia can bring to the reconstruction. Charles? I would just, just very quickly tag onto that. I think Rando is exactly right. I mean, Russia's playing on a different level here. Russia's playing the big geopolitical exactly. uh, image, self-presentation of where they want Syria to go. Um, Russia's refugee plan, which has been leaked in various different directions, has huge numbers mm. of people they say are interested in going back to Syria. Now, none of the polling of refugee populations uh, suggests that ru what Russia is presenting is at all accurate. But nevertheless, Russia's saying, you know, millions of Syrians want to come back into the country. But the regime, as we've seen on a military level during the conflict itself, the regime in Damascus is playing a different game and frequently one that doesn't add up to how Russia presents things on exactly. the bigger scale. So exactly. look at Jamil Hassan, uh, the head of Air Force Intelligence, who, gave, uh, who made comments to, uh, to one of the regime newspapers just a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. He said there are three mm -hmm. million mm -hmm. Syrians who are alive today mm -hmm. who are wanted on terrorism charges and they're all across the country. <laughs> and they're presumably mostly refugees. Right, right. Um, and so what kind of message does that send when Russia is saying, refugees, come back, Syria is safe, we have everything under the control, and then the most powerful intelligence chief in Syria says, well, half of you are wanted on terrorism charges, and we all know what that means. Um, uh, what does it also say in the Southwest when the Russians say that we've taken charge of reconciliation and stabilization, and there are arrest campaigns of people who were involved in local civil council activities, who might have been involved in the medical industry, involved in cleaning streets. But if you had any involvement in any organization that had any affiliation to opposition activity, you are seen as a terrorist threat by the state. So what does that say to people who are still being presented, like in the Northwest, with the prospect of reconciliation? 
So when we listen to what the Russians say, it's attractive because they've got the details, they're speaking diplomatically, they're speaking to the international community, but you've got to look at what's happening on the ground to see what the real reality is. That's what the Syrian refugees are looking at. They're not listening to Russia's promises um, and, and, and assertions. They're looking at what their real life prospects are on the ground. And that's going to be what we continue to see here. If our government here and European governments buy into Russia's promising line, it doesn't mean we're going to see significant progress on the ground. If we truly buy into it, we'll be buying into, basically, human rights violations in encouraging refugees to go back somewhere where their life may very well be at je in jeopardy. Well, they were all pushed to Idlib, right? And now this Idlib offensive could possibly <clears throat> push another three million into the internally displaced population or the refugee population. What are you going to say? No, no I, I was saying in terms of refugees, I mean, after all, what drove people out of Syria were security considerations and not economic considerations. Right. And so that is something that also needs to be taken into concern when talking about refugees going back. And as, as, as Charles said, uh, said, you know, when t stories, you know, are, are getting back to people who are still in... Uh, outside the country about you know people being imprisoned tortured who are going back taken in as soon as i return uh, or forced you know to to serve in the army i think that's going to be a deterrent the question i agree with charles is okay what will the international community especially the western community do about that right um, Matt? you know i'll add on to this is that you see about a month or so ago uh assad is quoted in russian papers as identifying uh, not just uh, in general refugees should come back, which is, of course, new because he's kicked them out, um, but to actually specify that he wants those, uh, or businessmen, those who own businesses. And here you begin to see how the scam is going to unfold uh, in the coming future, is to essentially his cast of oligarchs and business people uh, have already been uh, under sanctions from the US and the EU. We, of course, try to keep that as current as possible. So he needs a new face, a new group of business people to come back that he can empower and then say, here's my new group. We're in new Syria under me. Check me out. Give me money, please. This is, so he, it's, it's, he is, this is part of his game. And it's obviously with Russian support right now because as the point that oh, my panelists here have been making too is that both Russia and Iran, the two countries that have really helped Assad to remain in power are not doing well financially. So they're depending on this whole reconstruction process and right. they're depending on the number of refugees as high as possible because the higher the estimate, the more money they can get, the more that money can then be abused and used by the regime and not actually work for the Syrian people. And I think that's a, a very important uh, distinction as to, as to what is motivating uh, these right. actors. They're trying to carve something out, especially Iran, and also oil field. It's also, you know, good. This is the Russian sector, right? right, this right, is, right. They want that. Iran has its own deals. It's, right. right. It's all divided. Yeah, there's, I think, again, when you talk about Syria, we have to understand that everybody here, I, I'm sure they know, that Syria mainly are Sunni countries, not, not Shia, Sunni, not Shia country. And what happens today with Iran and Syria, they need their own hegemony. They need their own empire to come back to Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, even Yemen, even Palestine, Gaza, all this. So they are working ideologically. In Syria, there is a problem that most of the Syrians are non-affiliated with their religion or ethnicity, as Persian slash Shiism. So the, the way the Assad used the barrel bombs through the last five, six years, I think it was very systematic, operational, in order to kick as much as possible from the Sunni outside the, the Syria. And today, when we talk about Syria, we have 12 million in the regime controlled area, the Sunni are half of them. So the other half is half controlling. Unfortunately, among all these dynamics, the real minorities in Syria lost their ID. The Christian in Syria, there's no more Christian in Syria. The Yazidi, there's no more. I mean, all this small that makes Syria mosaic is very flourishing, very special. They left Syria and there are all this, there are all this some small church here and there. And the Sunni left. So today, when we talk about reconstruction and bringing back Syria together, uh, that model doesn't fit Iran, 100%. And that's why Assad and Jamil Hassan from that side, they are saying, 
uh, we have three million people are not allowed to come, and we have to just we put them in jail. As I talk about uh, homogeneous society, that means the other side are not part of us, which completely contradict the Russian proposal or Russian vision of the area that we don't care about Sunni Shia much. We need to be the superpower in that part of the world to show the American a new model of solving the problems that we have a successful story, no failing state, no military groups on, on that. So even when we go in that details, there's big difference between how Russia is looking at that issue and how Iran looking at the issue. But the common things, both they need money. Yes, and the, the three million that are supposedly on some terrorism wanted list, I've seen the way it works in Iraq is if you're a brother of one of these people, a father yes. of one of these yes. people, a cousin, you you're are also hostage. You're taken hostage. You're taken hostage. Taking the reconciliation the agreements too. Right, you have yeah. to spell this yeah. out. Right. Yeah. You, so yeah. you wanted. To... I mean, I just want to nuance a little bit uh, our discussion on reconstruction because often reconstruction is uh, looked at in terms of uh, you know money. Correct. That if you if you put money into roads, whatever, that's that's that can lead to some successful reconstruction. But again, I mean, when you look most of the research, and there is a study that many of you have read, done by the World Bank, titled "The Toll of War," when they talked about the the factor that has had the most significant impact on GDP cumulative losses in Syria, it is about economic connectivity. It's about the loss of social capital. It's about the lack of trust that people now have in each other in the institution. To start with, there was not much trust in institutions you know, among Syrians, but this is even more. I mean, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the peculiarities of the Syrian economy, but based on my own personal experience, you know, growing up in Lebanon, I used to go with my parents to Syria, and then we will buy something of some value, and then the merchant will basically say to us, just take it with you. I will come next week to your house in Beirut, and you can pay me in cash because he has a bank account in a Lebanese bank that he would like to put. I mean, what I'm saying is that the Syrian economy, economy is built on trust, on oh. personal relationship. This has all been now broken down by the war. And you know you can put money into it, but that is the most important factor that is going to be lacking in any reconstruction. And in fact, what's going to happen by putting money into massive infrastructure projects, what you are going to do, in fact, is you're going to exacerbate what led to the civil war to start with, which is what? Cronyism, rent-seeking, the kind of corruption that you are talking about. That's what's going to, that's the most likely scenario out of reconstruction under the present conditions in Syria. Right. So, so to, to follow up with, with Randa, again, from the survey that they have published yesterday at the German, uh, they say that more than 70% of the Syrian in Lebanon and Jordan, that the major problem they think they will face is the legal problem, who own their house, who own their lands. And that will lead them that part of prerequisite to come back to home, we need a legal system that a little bit should be fair, not transparent, fair, because the situation right. is bad. And that means there should be some change in the institution of the regime itself. And the regime say, I will not change. If you want to welcome, if you want to come back with my terms, my condition, ahlan wa sahlan, welcome. Otherwise, you can stay there. Exactly. So we go to that circle of using the money, the big money, for settlement of uh, very big tragedy in the Middle East, Syria. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, as uh, Charles and Randa say, there's still today, there's nothing concrete substance, what they are talking about. It's just big wording. And we are far away from solution. So the United States says it will not fund reconstruction in Syria. Uh, we heard Ambassador Nikki Haley say that yesterday. That the United States will not pay for what Assad and Russia did in Syria. You broke it, you own it, was, was the quote. Who will? Will the Russian strategy work? Will they get money from Europe? Will they get money from the Gulf? Will they sell this grand strategy that this is actually so a conciliation? Hence the refugees. Yes. This is the selling argument so what is our, to get the money. What is our warning to, to Europe and, and, the, and the Gulf region? Should they, should they do this? Uh, I would say they should not, but what, what so is our warning to them? We have two things about this. Number one, again, Assad doesn't, he is not interested to rebuild Syria that he destroyed. He just wants and the money. He needs to empower the area that is under his control and that doesn't need a lot of money. So when the World Bank make that we need 
$20 billion and somebody gave him $1 billion to say this incentive to change your attitude maybe to feel that you should be away from Iran and this $1 billion advance, he will use it just to empower his own base and tell them I cannot spread from Iran. Uh, yesterday, when this news broke out that some CIA guy visited Damascus, um, the, the, the leak was, was from Iran. It wasn't from Damascus. Yeah, Lebanese paper. The newspaper. Yeah. It was from Iran. Associated then with Reuters blog. endorsed it. But we, I, I, I think that, that the message is between them that if you, do, if you close too much to the Americans, as I said, we can break it out. You are not allowed to do it. That's why the break of the story didn't come from Syria, and it takes a long time. Uh, four months to, to the Iranian to leak it. Because at the same time, when the Iranian defense minister was in Syria and he made contract with Syria that we are staying in Syria. Right. So he's countering the U.S. message. Uh, some people in the administration still believe that incentivizing Assad by money, they will encourage him to split from Iran. They have this idea since a long time. Um, and the Iranian just sent the message that we know you came, we know your offer, and he made the deal with us. I don't think Assad needs or can absorb all these refugees to come back. And all the numbers that you are seeing, I think it doesn't make sense. The World Bank themselves, they make study about destruction of three major cities, Damascus, Hanus, Hama, and Halab. And the total cost of damage is $7 billion. Whereas they make another study that is $220 billion. It's, it's, it's both reports Sorry. at the World Bank. <laughs> It doesn't make sense. The only sense that they try some people from inside to increase the numbers, hoping that the asset will get $5 billion as incentive to quit from Iran, and $5 billion is enough to keep asset survival with all his base for 10 years from now. It, it is enough. I mean, that's, I think this is the asset game, just right. to get, no matter what. Just enough to shore up the base. And, that's and, it. and, and, and we are winners, and we don't need to bring all these people back. So will he get the money? At the Congress, there's a bill. We, we hope Senator Corker will pass it this in coming days. That, that literally makes very difficult for anyone to make investment with the Syrian government if there will be no transitional, real transitional process in Syria. Uh, it's almost secondary sanction. United States is the leader of the world. The message of United States will listen outside, even if people don't like the US messages. But they listen to it. Uh, the strong message from the United States, legal message, political message, I think it will make very big impact on GCC countries and other countries. I would say yes to a point. <laughs> um, I think for now, everyone is listening to the US. Um, but there are European countries who have specific domestic reasons, i.e. refugees in particular, um, European countries on the periphery of Europe, I should add, who already are now considering the fact that domestically they need to re-engage with the regime. That's a slippery slope that we're already on. As that slippery slope proceeds, the internal justification for more core internal European countries to follow suit will increase. Uh -huh. It's no coincidence that Putin had a great photo op meeting with Merkel outside in the garden in the evening, Whatever they discussed and whether they agreed on anything is irrelevant. Russia is presenting an image of Europe slowly turning the tide in terms of this opinion. So for now, the US opinion, as specific and as strong as it can be, matters. But eventually, the situation on the ground, the ev evolution of the conflict, the fact that many people think the conflict is over, which I would profoundly disagree with, um, will translate into new political actions. I have no faith, frankly, that Gulf states will follow through with US, uh, with, with US instruction because more regionally there are investment opportunities to invest in reconstruction. And, but I should add here that when we're talking about reconstruction, I want to kind of double up on what has already been said. We are, frankly speaking, talking about reconstruction of largely loyalist regime areas. Um, the BBC, for example, just recently visited Homs a few weeks ago, had a long video driving through the city. Homs and the districts they were in in the old city were recaptured by the regime, what, three, four years ago? They were totally destroyed. There had been zero reconstruction, nothing. Nobody, the, com the, the correspondent said, he didn't see a single human being in the old city of Damascus, which had been opposition controlled. For, uh, I'm sorry, of Homs. Four years later, the regime has not touched those areas that it recaptured. It has not sought to repopulate. It has not sought to rebuild. The money that is coming in, all these grand apartment buildings, 
They're either in existing loyalist areas or they're in areas that have been in Damascus depopulated and requisitioned by the state to reward loyalist communities. So uh, there was a, an op-ed that Robert Ford and, uh, and a colleague wrote several months ago that said, you know, reconstruction, continued UN assistance, it is subsidizing the regime. Straight, straight, straightforward. Um, and I have zero faith that reconstruction money will reward opposition or previously oppos opposition communities because we have no precedent for it. It doesn't frankly matter what the Russians say. It is still the Syrian government, whether we want to use that term or not, who will make the decision as to where that money goes. And it will largely go in the hands of people like Samar Foz, who are not going to be investing Is he their going to money. be sanctioned at some point? Who needs to be on the yeah, sanctions list? Sanctioned. He needs to be on the sanctions yeah. list because he is the new Mahlouf of the Syrian regime. Hey, can you tell us who he is for our audience? Because he, he is I mean, basically he, got his he, hands let in him, everything. Let him, let him um, talk Ross? about him. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm happy for anyone else to say. I mean, he's a very prominent Syrian businessman who remains unsanctioned. He has been Tied leveraged the by the regime. Um, tied to the IRGC, though, he is, I believe, trying to position himself as, as more, more Russian, Russian asset exactly. because he sees Russia as having more potential in the international community exactly. to win this debate and thus position him as an individual as the guy to rebuild Syria. He has strong ties in the UAE and elsewhere in the region, and he's rebuilding loyalist areas. And so when we talk about no reconstruction funds, we also need to talk about sanctioning these individuals who, as you said, are going to be now being put forward one after the other as alternative, right. you know, venues or as alternative ways by which the regime is going to get money. And, these show and that's why I think... Uh, and so that's why we need to monitor these right. names and these as they appear and then, you know, push, especially in this country, by the Syrian American communities, by the pro you know, opposition community to put these people on a sanctions list. So this is why we're now entering a phase where you hear the key word that you've heard uh, in other conflict areas, and specifically around Syria's neighbors, which is the word of stability. We need to present the facade of stability. Doesn't matter that there's an ongoing war, right? That there's still an offensive that will take place in Idlib. But Russia needs to have it look like everything is stable, the new oligarchs, the Samir Fases can come and have a, it, it create uh, opportunities for investment. And Iran, meanwhile, which has its own uh, its entrenchment enterprise within Syria, uh, gets to continue it. Uh, it can use a little bit of quiet in the meantime. But this is why we have to present from their perspective the idea that everything is stable, it's fine, while Assad gets rehabilitated and becomes normalized so that we can all get back to this place in 2011 beforehand, which really just ensures that the exact same problems that we faced occur again, only this time it's with a new Syria, and those that aren't paying attention will still be giving money and the process will continue. Uh, Foz, sorry, uh, Foz, till recently, he had PR company in DC. He had what? PR company representing his yes. interests in the United States. And uh, when we explode to the media, he, they, they say, oh, sorry, we don't know who's he. But I will not be surprised that if he hire another company. So he's already, he and his groups, and that category of people, they're already working in the United States to send their messages that counter what I'm saying. But to make things more clear, many people, they accuse the Syrian who are pro-revolution that we are working just to make people suffering inside Syria. And this kind of sanctions is affecting their lives, which is for sure that's affecting their lives. The, the counter argument we try to always to say that the sanction by itself is not the means, it's, it's, it's the tools to reach to settlement of the, the conflict. We don't need Syrian to die more. Already we lost, God knows, million Syrian were killed. God knows how many the exact number of refugees has left. Um, when we approach to the U.S. government and all its apparatus, we can tell them that the sanction by itself is not enough. If you don't have literally end game to settle this, pro, this, this crisis, then doing only the sanctions, it's good in short term, but it's hurting everybody, including us as a Syrian who are living outside. So that's why we, we back to what Randa said, that, or Charles and, and Matt, that the, the US should be very clear what they want. And they should lay out the tools. And they should tell all their allies, this is the end game. 
this is the tools, and this is what we should all be on the same page. If we, if they fail to do this, I think it become very tactical things, sh small, short-term things that it could fire back on everybody. I think sanctioning fouls would actually hurt fouls quite a bit. I think, I think that's building on what Just Bassam has said. I think the right. next phase of uh, this war against the Assad regime uh, is going to be primarily in the political, diplomatic, and economic arena. And I think it's going to require new sets of, um, I'd say, s uh, skills, but also new sets of mechanism that the opposition and its constituency can deploy in waging this next phase. Because part of the narrative of the Assad regime going forward is that it's no longer these are terrorists, but these are people who are trying to deny you food. True. These are people who are going to try to deny you, you know, a road or a, you know, a, a better life or a school for your children or a hospital for your family. So that, that the challenge then for the opposition, especially for the expat position, which is, and they have to play this role, is how you are going to, you know, message that kind of uh, effort to the Syrian people so that, who are inside, of course, inside the country, so that uh, the, the narrative that Assad is going to be playing in, in reaction to this does not win. The, unfortunately, the, the, everybody fall in the Assad trap uh, in the civil war. So his community, uh, I'm not sectarian, but we have to talk as it is. The, the Alawite and the Christian, they, they were selling, he sold them the pictures of other Syrian as extreme Islamists who want to come and kill them. And these two groups, or mainly the minorities, they join. They believe that maybe this is the way to survive through the Assad, but not in Assad, through the Assad. The other side, they believe now it's that the other communities, they are just want to kill them. And they don't see the world of freedom, of world of democracy, or transparency, or human rights. It's irrelevant. It's, become, it's up to them, too. So he destroyed the structure of Syria. As it was already weak, it's he destroyed it. So to, to go forward from today to, to tomorrow, even Syria, who went outside the Assad control, the destruction is more than 70 80%. God knows. It's a huge destruction. The other side, they have a huge loss of life. Today, when you talk about the Alibek community, more than 10% of their young people were killed. They are suffering. There is no more manpower in that part. That's why so many Iranian or pro-Iranian militia in Syria to fill that gaps. So we back to the messaging. So the Syrian or the American, nobody cares about Syrian, Syrian message. It should be American message, international community message to the whole Syrian people that we are not against you. We want to solve this problem. And we should, and the people who drag all the Syrian into this war, they should be accountable. And the whole people from opposition and from the regime. Uh, that kind of message will help for reconciliation later on. It's not about Assad himself, as bad as he is. The other side, they did the crimes as well. So everybody should be accountable, and the message should be unifying the whole Syria. In the political process, economic will be one of the tools, and commitment to, to stabilize that area, that will be very important for the whole region. But isn't Assad winning? Why would he have to do any of that? Because uh, he's weak. He's weak, he's weak, but weak is good enough, unfortunately. He's weak because I tell you by numbers, when we look about how many pro-Iranian militia in Syria, we are talking about between 70 to 100,000. That means he doesn't have the manpower on the ground. He's hostage by Iran. When we talk about Russian Air Force base in Syria, God knows how many people they say, uh, that provide him the air cover. That means he's a person who doesn't have manpower or air cover. And he's hostages by both Russia and Iran. So it's not up to him to say yes or no, rather than his other two powers on the ground. They are to correct that, that, Russia and Iran are winning. Yeah. 100%. There's no, there's no, even the, the concept of normalizing Assad or to try to get back, you know, stuff the genie back in the bottle. There is no new Assad. He will be a puppet of Iran and of, and of Russia. And to the extent, I think there's a bit too much overblown in the diplomatic realm where we think that uh, Assad is one day going to suddenly turn around and, and push out Iran and say that Iran has to go. This was in diplomatic circles years ago. Part of the, it was just a marriage of convenience between uh, Iran and the Assad regime when it wasn't. These are 
core fundamental values and interests that they share in a regional view. And for Iran, Syria represents the linchpin of the, of the region and its access to Hezbollah, which is its crowning jewel. This, this is, is, is really important to them. So I think, just think we need to be aware of that. So just to, to add to what I'm saying, that to give you the example, in Astana process, all Astana process, Assad never been on the table. It's Iran, Russia, Turkey. And whenever they deal, agree on, on anything, the three countries sign it, but never the regime, which shows that they look at him as not partner or not equal partner for them. When the, whenever there's a Stana meeting, they ask the regime and the opposition because they saw they are equally balanced. But right. never ask the regime, even he is government representing as head of state or has sovereignty, to sit on the table with the three countries. Let's talk about that relationship. Uh, Turkey, Iran, and Russia, Turkey, the United States, and then Turkey's position in North Syria. This Idlib offensive affects Turkey, affects what they're trying to do in the north. So do you, you want us to resolve on that? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, it's a huge subject. You know, the question is, <laughs> no. we haven't talked about Turkey enough yet, but Turkey was at the table, and again, the Assad regime wasn't. What is Turkey's position on the Idlib offensive that's about to happen? What is Turkey's position on reconstruction? Uh, what is Turkey's position on tr being an advocate for Sunni refugees in Turkey to get back into Syria, get back into Raqqa and Deir Azur, now being told no by the regime? So, so that's the question. Well, I mean, Turkey is, as far as I can see it, the only neighboring country that has substantially invested security-wise across the border inside Syria. And it's done that primarily for domestic reasons. Um, domestically, the PKK threat, vis-a-vis -vis right. the YPG is seen as an existential national security issue. And the refugees, um, three and a half million Syrian refugees in Turkey right now, by a very long margin more than any other country. And the refugees from Italy are likely to go to Turkey and, as well, right? Well, the, the Turkish border is totally shut down. Right. So frankly, I don't know what happens if two and a half to 3.2 million people start marching towards the Turkish border. I don't think the Turks would open it up unless things were seriously at crisis point. Um, and that, uh, but, but to get specifically to the Northwest, I mean, the Turkish military has invested in establishing 12, they call them observation posts. They're fast becoming forward operating bases. I mean, they're now ringed by reinforced concrete walls. They're allegedly, some of them have Turkish anti-aircraft missile systems. Um, they have su substantial armored personnel carriers, main battle tanks. So they have invested in creating a ring separating the opposition from the regime and Iranian militias to enforce de-escalation, to prevent a further refugee flow towards the Turkish border. The Turkish government has made it patently clear this is a red line. We will not accept a major explosion in hostilities in Idlib because of the implications that would have. That whole, compli that whole complicated situation is made even more complex by the fact that our allies, the Kurds, have suggested that if the regime was to attack Idlib, they might be willing so to assist the them in doing right. so. Um, and that then makes Idlib an even more existential situation for the Turks. Um, the, so that red line, as far as I'm concerned, is still a red line. But clearly, the Russian military buildup that you talked about, the naval buildup we talked about at the beginning, um, a whole other aspects. I mean, for 19 or 20 days in a row now, the regime has been transporting troops up, all ringing around that ring of Turkish observation posts. We've had a series of escalations in airstrikes. It's pretty clear that something will happen there, whether the Turks want it to or not. For me, the question is whether or not Turkey and Russia can negotiate a compromise in which some peripheral areas of this northwestern zone are allowed to fall under regime control, and the core of Idlib remains under Turkish guardianship. But even then, we have a more complicated issue, because there are terrorist organizations inside that core zone, which Turkey has tried to engage with in order to be able to control them, in order to be able to force them to dissolve themselves and merge under Turkish command. Now, those negotiations have substantially intensified in the last couple of days, according to people I know on the ground. But I'm still not sure there's much of a prospect of that agreement coming to place. But really, unless that happens, there will be military action in the Northwest. And then we'll see, and I wrote about this a few weeks ago, we're talking about three, potentially 3.2 million people in an amount of territory that represents 1.5% of Syria's national territory. That is a massive humanitarian disaster waiting to happen that will literally make everything we've seen happen in Syria over the last seven years look like a drop in the ocean. 
So quite why the US has remained so disinterested in this issue, I have no idea. Same goes for the Europeans who have much more to worry about in terms right. of the refugee situation. This is potentially a catastrophic issue that will destabilize that whole northern border and potentially have all kinds of other ripple effects. And the only message coming out of the United States with regards to Idlib right. is don't use sarin gas. Exactly. I, think, but I, mean, I mean, we have to watch, I think, the right. upcoming meeting of uh, the mm -hmm. summits, the presidential yeah. summits in Tabriz on September 7, because I think I would, I, would, I would predict nothing will happen before then. And I think if there is a decision mm -hmm. on the kind of plan that is acceptable to the Turks and the, to the Turks and the Russians, I think they, they'll need also to have the Iranian you know, support for that. And so, uh, and then if there is an attack, it's going to happen after that date. Right. But then we will have a meeting going on in Geneva on September 14 with Stefan de Mistura and the five, six mm -hmm. countries uh, that are not part of the Astana axis, uh, that will be interesting to also see. If this attack were to happen before the September 14 meeting, I think we are going to have a whole different September right. 14 meeting exactly. than, than otherwise. Right. I think from the United States perspective in this part of, of, of Syria, the current thinking is uh, to the extent that we're going to have Turkey and Russia and Iran who have formed a temporary coalition in an argument with friction, then that then that then that's fine. That's that 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 works out. I'm not saying that's my perspective. I'm saying that that's that's what I, what it could be. Um, I mean, aside from the fact that the U.S. has really not wanted to uh, take that active in a role inside of Syria. As for the red line on on uh, the use of chemical weapons there, I think it would constitute an interesting test because, as I've been saying, that the idea is to is to create the facade of of stability so that. Russia can say that it's the uh, proverbial big boy in the room, give us money, we got it under control. Um, the use of chemical weapons that forces an American response, no matter how strong or how weak it would be, is inherently destabilizing. So that really would pose a problem. So it would be interesting to see what happens, aside from the obvious fact that the use of chemical weapons is, of course, a war well, crime and arm. It's sarin gas, so because we're, we're OK with chlorine. We're, it's sarin gas that we're right, talking this about. Is, <laughs> Yeah, and bullets and tanks Although and barrel bombs. Our strike in Duma did turn out to have been a response to a chlorine attack and good, not good, a sarin. So. I didn't like the language it said, we will react to any verified chemical attack, and that verification process is something the UN Security Council always wants to put in place before the U.S. takes military action. It allowed over a year between the Obama's declaration of a red line right. to 2013. But again, Idlib is much more complicated mm -hmm. than playing between Turkey, Russia, Syria, or... It was never indeed. supposed to fall back to the regime, <laughs> indeed. and now it's on the brink. No, but I'm trying to say that inside that geographical area, literally, we have a lot of extremists. A lot of what? Extre terrorists. Extremists, yeah, yeah. Jolani's there every day Jelani talking there, to there, Daesh there, Harassadine there. There's thousands and thousands of really extremist group. How we handle this? So I think Russian, they have, we have a lot of, over there. There's uh, from Shishania, from, right. from south of Russians. They are not only European. There's many people from Russian uh, previous countries. How we solve this problem? Peacefully, how you can solve this problem, or military, how you solve this problem? We are talking about 20,000 plus minus of all this different nationalities who are really believing in destroying the world to have their own khilafat. Right, right. So they are dangerous for Syria and dangerous for the world. If these people reach to Europe, it will be a disaster. If they stay in Syria, it will be a disaster. That's why I think I, I more lean that Russia will be given a green light to destroy the whole that areas which assume to be very much Nusra, Daesh, uh, Harassadine. Uh, the their town is a terrorist campaign. The last it, terrorist it, stronghold is, is exactly. Is so I think they will. I hope I'm wrong, but my feeling that with the deal with the Turkeys, don't attack here, don't attack here. Then they will specify certain areas, which still have thousands of people to say these people are extremism. We know them, we identify them, and we have no problem even to, to wipe them out of. And here we talk about 20,000, maybe 30,000. I don't know. Maybe. Well, you're, you're talking about the, the number of extremists, and then when you're talking about the 3.2 million that could be exited from Idlib if, if an offensive begins, civilians. civilians, where do they go? If they can't go to Turkey, where do they go? Do they, do they start going into Iraq? I, again, as, as, where do they go? As Charles said now, maybe there will be some deal that. Let's zoom the areas of 
uh, operation. Right. And then we have the, this, this one dynamics. The second dynamics that the regime want to take over Idlib. And the third dynamics, the Iranian want to take Idlib in order to connect Iraq to the Mediterranean away from Syrian regime. Right. They are already in, in the Euphrates. It's just need the part of Idlib and they reach to the Mediterranean. So this is completely different dynamics from everything are being said because they have their own interests. Right. Jointly together, I see it will be uh, big massacres because nobody is against killing this terrorist. This question, how much we should kill and where and who will take over? Uh, two, two quick points. I think, to... building on what Bassam has said, uh, there are not many points of convergence between the United States and Russia yeah. and Syria. One of them, one of the few points of convergence is fighting you know, and defeating these terrorists. So I can see your point. And that's why you know, the United States has taken the stance vis-a-vis -vis Idlib the way it has taken, uh, partly because there is a convergence of interest on defeating this. The humanitarian situation is different. In response to your questions about where are they going to go, one proposal I heard that was being put on the table during the last meeting between Putin and two and the Russian officials and the visiting Turkish delegation is to have a buffer zone on the border, on the Syrian-Turkish border, where these refugees would be allowed to be there with the protections, you know, from the Turks, from the Russians, you know, uh, but not allowed to go inside Turkey. So that's one proposal about if this attack were to happen, this is where the civilian is Turkey on board with that? Because uh, that's one of the proposal. Right? That's one of the proposal that was put on the table right. during those discussions. But again, if we have to, as a Syrian now, if we have to reread, to rewrite the history, why these people first came to Syria, and who get them to Idlib? It was the Russian and Turkey. I mean, they facilitate all that movement from all over Syria. They put that. Go to Idlib. Idlib will be your sanctuary. So it, it, it's, this process has been going on for the last three years. It wasn't today or tomorrow. The starting point was the regime killing everybody. Then he released all the Qaeda people in his jails. They built up their networks. Every time they were defeated, they go to Idlib. Russia agreed to facilitate UN protect Turkey blessing. And today, everybody asks, OK, we have the problem. How we solve this? Um, I think there should be more depth analysis and looking into why we have that kind of scenarios, especially the end of that scenario will be bloody, no matter what. The best case scenario, it will be bloody. I just wanted to mention, first on the buffer zone, we already basically have them. Um, as far as the Turks are concerned, the Euphrates Shield, um, Afrin area for the Turks, that's their buffer zone. Um, if we're talking about expanding that towards exactly. Idlib, that's what's up for potentially yes. for negotiation. Though I don't, that would have to be a substantial Idlib buffer zone for the Turks to remain, to remain happy. In terms of um, you know U.S.-Russian affinity on the on the Nusra thing, I mean, I, on that in isolation, I couldn't agree more. Um, in the depth, I mean, as someone who spent the last seven years working primarily on Nusra, um, I'm very well aware that in the U.S. intel community and the CT community. Um, they have a stark difference of opinion with the Russians on how to deal with the Nusra threat. Um, Nusra is not like ISIS. ISIS differentiated itself from the Syrian revolution for a reason. It had an agenda, and it was distinctly different from the Syrian revolutionary one. Nusra has made a point, with a brief exception between maybe 2016 and 17, of embedding its agenda inside the Syrian revolution. We are one and the same. Now, the Syrians, as Bassam makes clear, have consistently disagreed with that. They have consistently distrusted that line from Nusra. But the point being, though, is that, and I want to speak in a very practical sense, the biggest danger we face of a major escalation in hostilities is seeing some portion of the Northwestern community, for the first time, agreeing with the Nusra agenda. Mm. By massively exploding and annihilating Northwestern Syria in one way or another, the people will finally say, you were right all along. Mm. You were the only people who told us the international community, in the end, would turn their backs when we all get massacred. You were the ones who always told us what would happen, and now it is. So on the US side, we've always known that a mass military campaign on a Nusra territory would backfire. It would only serve to justify Nusra's long-time narrative, which is why we've always opposed it, which is why we've always challenged Nusra by targeted drone strikes on leadership figures rather than ever having a major military campaign, let alone supporting one. And I think from a CT perspective and knowing real in detail how Nusra thinks, 
That is the big danger that we face here. For the first time, seeing disenfranchised Syrians stuck in the northwest with a totally shut Turkish border, saying, you are our only hope. Um, and I'm really, really serious about that, not from an ideological affinity, not because they believe in Nusra's agenda, but because they're the only guys still, who will still be holding a gun when those hostilities start. And Julian, I, I, I don't agree an attack. with you. It was an attack. I don't Idlib. agree with you, it's... Charles. Oh, no, go ahead, and then we'll go to you. Go yeah, because an attack on Idlib right. is, not go is going to be a Mosul. Like mm -hmm. it's going to be a rock like it's not going to be you know <laughs> targeted strike on no. few. Uh, mm -hmm. So I mean we have to assume that an attack once a decision has been made about an attack on Idlib, it's going to be that kind of attack with that kind of civilian casualty. And Jelani has told everyone to stay in place. Anybody who leaves will be considered a traitor and yeah. do not trust yeah. Turkey because they're a temporary ally. And just one thing I forgot to say is when we're talking about these separating these few areas that might be ceded to the to the regime and the Russians. Do we honestly think that all of the extremists that we all We're oppose not. Are, are just going to stay <laughs> yeah, there to exactly. be targeted? Exactly. Of course they're not. They'll follow along with everyone exactly. else. So this whole idea that we can separate them by negotiating have certain zones, pockets yeah, yeah. is a complete fantasy. Exactly. And if the Russians are, are pushing that, that is precisely what they want. Because they want the... So the, the Russians have always pushed the US, demarble Nusra, HTS, everyone else, from the rest of the opposition. Now they're pushing that line with the Turks separate them from everyone else, then we might have a solution. Why are they pushing that point? Because they know it's impossible. Because HTS isn't just going to separate itself and go and sit in a town for themselves to be bombed while all the rest of Idlib is safe and secure. Um, so that's precisely why Idlib has to be challenged in a much more long-term way, which I think is what the Turks and the Russians have been trying up until now. But the regime is pushing the point, because they've taken every other de-escalation zone, only Idlib remains. So the Russians have no, no choice but to become more malleable to the regime's determination to retake that, to, to take that northwestern territory. I, I don't agree with, with you, Charles, that the people are more buying Nusra slogans today. No, they're uh, not. They're not? No. Well, no. If, if hostilities start, if. Oh, okay. some might. Yeah. You know, because most of the guys from the open sources, Twitter, Facebook, or, or articles from that part, from civil society, from just normal people, they are saying we stuck what we're, where to do, what to do as civilian, as, as people, that we cannot uh, join the Nusra because we don't agree with them. We know they are destroyed our social life in the last two, three years. At the same time, the regime is not acceptable for us. He is the reason of all this. And some ideas was floated, and some paper has been signed that we need Turkish mandate on that part, so they will protect us from both Nusra and and the regime. So we have component in the ground, which is very important. They are the civilian guys who, till today, nobody tried to reach out to them, to empower them, to to kick this Nusra out of the areas. It happens two years before, one year before when certain areas, the, the civil society, the people, the normal people, they just ask Nusra to leave, leave our areas, and they left. Today, we don't see that moment or that movement from, from the donors or international community to talk with the locals to say how you can help us to save you. We don't have this conversation. The conversation is Astana, Geneva, us here, but not them. I think they could have better solution in short term than any other ideas from outside. You have been in Iraq, you know, the locals always look into things different from people right. from outside. Mm -hmm. Assam is absolutely right. But what I'm saying is, I'm those sorry, people... I misunderstood you. No, that's fine, that's fine. Th those people... I like it better when you're disagreeing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Those people, many, of whom, I, many of whom I know just like you do, have always had the right uh, uh, arguments, the right suggestions. No one's ever listened to them. But those people, sadly, will become totally irrelevant True. if hostilities start in Idlib. Okay. And the people who will become relevant are the ones who still want to hold the gun. And we might, we're not talking about 3 million people. But if HTS right now, as far as my numbers are concerned, are about 10 to 12,000 fighters, if 10,000 more guys who still hold guns join HTS when hostilities start, what the hell was the point in counterterrorism hostilities in Idlib? Um, that's the problem I have. Punish a population to right, send a message. Exactly. That's what it's yeah. like. Um, so I've heard from, from all of you. It, it doesn't sound, we, we do believe that the Idlib offensive will happen regardless, even if Turkey's against it. It looks like it's going to happen, and Turkey's already looking at the aftermath instead of preventing it. Mm -hmm. So do, do we see it happening? Turkey, as far as I know, this, 
I'm not sure about it, but I understood that they have communication with the EU in order to spend the money that the EU committed to give to Turkey on refugees to be spent inside Syria. So Turkey is laying the foundation by EU money to spend it inside Syria so the Syrian refugees in Turkey come back to Syria. If that's true, I don't know if it's true or not, that means they have something after Idlib. That right. means there is some kind of understanding with the, with the Russian that maybe Euphoria Chills, maybe some part of northern Idlib, part of Aleppo will be under our own influence. We invest your money as a EU in that part and we will try to let all the refugees come back. And that goes back to Jelani's point about not trusting Turkey because, you know, Jelani's telling everybody to stay and fight in Idlib and now it looks like Turkey's already looking for I don't believe after. in conspiracy theories, but every time the regime takes big part of Syria, Turkey gets something else. Yeah. You know, and, and, and this is a trend. The MO has been, until now, you know, like now they're talking about reconciliation and trying to separate the terrorists from the non-terrorists and strike these reconciliation deals. I mean, this is what happened pre-East Ruta. This is what happened pre house I mean, it's the same MO. So it's the same playbook. And so, and we know how that playbook ended in East Ruta. We know how that playbook ended in Southwest. And it's going to end the same way. In so I want to ask Matt about... Israel in this whole thing. It seems that Israel is okay with Assad. It's okay with him being in power. They're not okay with Iran being there. Uh, Iran keeps looking towards Russia and wondering why Russia is not using its air defense assets to protect it when Israel strikes it. Can you talk a little bit about Israel's position in Syria vis-a-vis -vis Iran and Russia? Their, their perspective from the beginning and in the conversations that I've had with senior officials there is uh, Throughout the course of the war, there was no organized uh, um, Sunni opposition, and they basically had to had to sit on the fence and see what side it was going to go. Thinking, of course, in the beginning that, of course, if Libya was so important that the world was going to get involved, then the atrocities being committed in Syria would would spark some type of reaction. That didn't happen over time. Now, uh, Russia, as it turns out, by two. By 2015, by the time of their entry, they have come in and uh, essentially have owned the situation. So Israel has had to go have several meetings with, uh, with Putin in order to come up with rules of the game. Oftentimes you see reported as an agreement. It's not actually an agreement. It's Israel trying to explain that its red lines are essentially that it's going to attack Iran positions this entire entrenchment enterprise inside of Syria, wherever it is, and that it wants Iran out of the country. That, that's the main point. It seeks to have Russia be OK with that, which, it, which from Russia's perspective, it, it appears that it is. Um, but this is the, the choice Israel has had to make at, at this point. And so it enforces its own red lines. It has done so for a long period of, a long period of time. But again, this is one of those things that should Iran decide that it really wants to be very publicly and actively working on its entrenchment enterprise right now, it gets back to being against the idea of stability. So we would like to see a gradual uh, entrenchment enterprise because we've seen the effect that Israel has had when it has bombed the T4 base in Homs right. province. It, it can tell when uh, these uh, game-changing weapon systems are, are coming in from Iran or being transported, they will take them out. So this is all gets back to the stability aspect right. and Israel's making sure that it's on, it maintaining good relations with Russia, which it says, very good deconfliction lines. This is what it publicly says. And with the United States, of course. Right. I'll go to Charles, then you end up. And then you must say, um, and I've engaged a lot with the Israelis on these subjects in the last few months. and. Um, I think the Israelis have drawn very clear red lines, both in public and in private, and they've enforced them very, very clearly in public and in private. And I think so far the Russians have shown a willingness to allow them to do that. They've not shown an ability to constrain the Iranians to the extent to which the Israelis want. And the Russians have only very recently kind of admitted to that. We cannot right. do what you want us to do with the Iranians. They are not leaving Syria. Um, we saw that kind of wild, ridiculous Russian proposal to push Iranians 100 kilometers from the Golan Heights, which meant they would have had to evacuate Damascus. I mean, it's, <laughs> right, right, right. it's ridiculous. Um, but the Israelis have done a few interesting things. I forget what it's called now, but the big, oper big air operation they conducted a few months ago where they five hit multiple hour air targets. Campaign, yep. That, 
um, has led to a kind of giddy excitement. You know, we have, to use a phrase, mown the grass to an extent to which we now do feel secure. We have sent the message that we are capable of hitting you anywhere we want, whenever we want. No one will get in our way. Um, and I'm told that had a pretty significant impact. Uh, and it certainly had an impact in terms of the Iranians demonstrating a certain risk aversion. After that strike, all the talk was about, well, Hezbollah and the Iranians, they're going to have to hit Israel back. They did. But intriguingly, what I'm told is that when they fired those grad rockets into, into Israeli territory, the Israelis intercepted radio chatter between Hezbollah's HQ in Damascus and their frontline fighters in the it southwest. Say, no, saying, here are your coordinates for targets. Right. And when you looked at every one of those coordinates, they were either completely open space or they were the coordinates of Iron Dome missile defense systems. In other words, the Iranians did not want to threaten the life of a single Israeli. That's real risk aversion from the Iranians. Yes, we responded, but we did it in the most unthreatening way possible. Um, and that was interesting. Having said that, I'm deeply skeptical that this mowing the grass strategy of enforcing short-term red lines is going to lead to long-term Israeli security. I mean, the Iranians are playing the long game here. They know they've won the strategic victory in Syria. They know they have a capacity, and they will continue to have a capacity to have forces on the ground, both Iranian and foreign, to have uh, strategic depth in Lebanon and the Palestinian territories, um, and in Syria in the long term. Eventually, there will be a quiet around Syria in which they can consolidate um, in a way that they're not able to do right now. So this temporary period of calm is, I think, temporary. And the biggest irony was when the Israeli defense minister said the morning that Undorf peacekeepers returned to the, to the demilitarized zone on the Golan, the Israeli defense minister said, this is the first day Israel has sensed a, a calm and stability across our border with Syria. And then what happened that night? Israel conducted its first ever airstrike on ISIS militants in southwestern Syria when they tried to infiltrate the border with uh, Israel. The first time ever ISIS had tried to do that was the first day that the regime and Russia took control of the border. So I think we all know how the Iranians work, how they've worked elsewhere in the region. They are willing to take and make short-term concessions in order to win the long-term gains. And so this mowing the grass strategy, I think, is, is, is overly short-termist. There are also rules of the game between Iran and Israel. And by Iran, I also include uh, Hezbollah that you can see not only apparently by the, by the targeting uh, choice from Iran, but none of them are anxious to include Lebanon and what everyone has thought of as the catastrophic coming third Lebanon war that since 2006, every expert has said is on the horizon and it's going to be devastating to both Lebanon and large swaths of Israel. So no matter what happens, you have the rules of the game where Hezbollah can target coming from Lebanon, but they target from Syria, and Israel will attack inside of Syria, but they keep Lebanon out of it because once that can of worms is opened, you have a much larger regional conflict, and this is incidentally not something that the overlords of Syria today, namely Russia, would be quite happy about because that is in fact very destabilizing. Yes. I want Brenda? to make two yes. points. Yes. Uh, the first point on the Iranian presence in Syria. I think uh, finally the Americans, you know, Bolton and the, Isra and the Russians are, say, are, despite our statement that we want Iran out, I think we are coming to the realization that nobody would be able to force them out. Hence, I think what is the pragmatic course of action going forward, and that's where a US-Russia dialogue is needed, is on the red lines, on IRGC Quds activities. And those can be enforced by Russia. If there is an agreement between the Americans and the Russians on certain red lines, on certain activities, I think Russia then can deploy some of its political capital with uh, Iran to enforce those red lines. And that conversation has yet to be had, uh, right. in my opinion. But it <laughs> needs to be had. The second point I want to make is that until now, Russia has been able successfully, and that's where the Americans, in my opinion, have been at fault, in, not, in avoiding to make a choice among three of its, if we can put it, partners allies. Russia has one now of the strongest relationship with Israel, and they would like to maintain that. They have a 
multi-factor multi relationship with Iran. So when I talk about the relationship with Iran, it's not only about Syria, it's about Central Asia, it's about the Caucasus, it's about the Caspian. So there is a, vera, you know, a whole group of interests interwoven in this Russia-Syria relationship. And there is the relationship with Turkey. And, on e and so far, they have avoided having to choose between allies and between partners in Syria. They have avoided to choose between, you know, Israel and Iran. They have avoided to choose between Turkey and Iran. And they have been able to maintain those three relationships going. And the question is, will Idlib, and, and what they want yeah, to do Idlib is, change that. because Idlib is one of the points where they have to make a choice, and they are trying to avoid making that choice. Right. Because there will be a loss to that choice as far as Russia is concerned. As she's and saying, that's going sorry. to be interesting to watch going forward. As he's saying, there is a lot that, uh, that Russia can do, the question of will and capacity, but there is a lot, a very positive role that it could play, in theory. Yes. <laughs> so I just, just to talk about, think about Syria and Israel, Assad knows very well that his gate for the international community is Israel. And is what else? It's Israel. Assad knows that right. one of the major gates, one of main gates for him, to be back to the international community is Israel and security safety in Israel. I will not be surprised if there will be some kind of deal is going on right now between Syria and Israel to counter Iran, to show the Israeli, I'm the good guy for you, I protect you for the last four years, help me to help you to protect your area for the coming 10 years. Uh, there was a floating report yesterday in the Israeli newspaper that the Russians are supporting or so proposing some kind of uh, safe zone between Golan and inside Syrian land, something like 20 to 30 kilometers right. is different from the Iranian things. It's part of the peace talks with Israel on Golan. So I think um, I, I will not be surprised if we will see in the coming days or weeks or months is some kind of communication between Assad and Israel on that kind of settlement on the Golan doesn't mean peace rather than talks. Because he knows that when if, if the Israeli endorse him, I think the world will be more open to support Assad regardless of all reconstruction stuff that we waste our time talking about. It would be the one time where if Israel supported somebody, the world would back up Israel. <laughs> yep. It would probably be so the that then, then the, the, the whole kind of reconstruction stuff that we were talking right. about, I don't think it will be much relevant. I think he will have more space. He tried to sell himself for the last two years that I'm with you, I want to get rid of Iran, I cannot help me. That's his message for the last two years for, for, for many different uh, regional allies. So but in the meantime, this agreement with uh, this type of agreement coming out, we're, we're looking at what is it, 20 kilometers, 80 kilometers from, from the Golan Heights, right. the Israeli side. With Damascus being the area that's not touched. Right, right. Well, so then they try to make it smaller because right. uh, shorter distance. These are all going to, from the Israeli perspective, be irrelevant because, again, we're, this isn't, uh, you know, 2000. This isn't, we're not talking about Katusha rockets that go a couple of miles. So Iran, Iranian forces are entrenched uh, 10 kilometers further further back from the line. Right, right. It doesn't matter. It's all the rockets can still miss whole, exactly. It's the whole area. So it's not going to change anything, but it certainly will, as, as Bassam is saying, it will, you know, give the, uh, the appearance of, yes, all roads do lead to Moscow. So I want, to, I want to ask about, we haven't talked about the United States, what the United States wants to do in, in, in Syria in detail. But I'd also like to ask you what ISIS is doing. Is ISIS still relevant? Is, ISIS, is there still an ISIS? Uh, is there an ISIS resurgence? We're starting to see one in Iraq. As ISIS moves towards the uh, ISIS 2.0 al-Qaeda model, are we seeing that in Syria? And in that, what is the U.S. strategy? It is a defeat ISIS strategy, and now it's a get Iran out of Syria strategy without really doing anything and changing any posture. Uh, so I'd like to throw that to, to the panel. Anybody who would like to address that? Even for ISIS, we have to divide it geographically. So I will talk about the major part, which is right. the SDF control area where the American forces are there. Uh, ISIS already has been defeated. There are small pockets in that part that I think within two, three weeks maximum, it will be completely uh, defeated and the American uh, rightly they can announce that we finish the Khilafat. Um, but that's not the problem. The problem uh, that the area under SDF still till today is not balanced between the Arab and the Kurds. 
the United States is supporting SDF. They put all their heavy weight behind SDF, and SDF is misusing or misdealing with the Arab tribes in that area. They, they always deal with them as secondary in everything. And this is the huge loophole where ISIS can come back. If the United States in that part will not balance their act or, right. or talk with SDF to make more balance act toward all the Arab tribes, which is they are more two-thirds than the population than the Kurds, then you, you, ISIS will be there sooner or later. We saw this in Iraq. And the, the Iranian will be there. Uh, so till today, we are in the safe side. It's about tomorrow and after tomorrow how things will go on. When the SDF deal with Damascus, all the Arab forces who are part of SDF, their main concern that the SDF, the Kurdish forces, will sell the Arab forces to the regime. They say, go to join the regime. Where are the Kurds? We'll have our own forces. We're seeing some cooperation between IRGC, Quds Force militias, and, and the YPG in areas like Deir Azur and Raqqa. And, and, and we're likely to see security backslides. It's in Aleppo. I've seen your graphic. We've seen, yeah. we've seen your graphic Aleppo as well, part. where you're starting to see that that future handoff of seized well, the American, territory. The American, literally, they have opportunity to, they, to have successful story in that part if they can just make the balance correct. They will have a successful story. If they failed, and to today they are not paying too much attention to that balance, um, I hope not, but I see things will be more unstable. And you have Afrin and Idlib being magnets for the YPG to, to move away from these areas in Deir Ezzur and Raqqa, where they've, t they've held territory, part of counterinsurgency uh, strategy, two pillars, clear and hold. The hold force is the YPG. The hold force is the SDF. And they're more concerned about what's happening west of the Euphrates than what's happening east of the Euphrates. So right for security backslide. Yes. Um, there's a lot of awareness, though, within the very recently appointed State Department Syria team. Yes, the yes, importance definitely. The Azor and the Arab tribes. And just yesterday, there was a visit by US officials to all of the main Arab tribal leaders in Deir Azor. And as far as I'm aware, that's the, at least the first publicized one I've seen in a really long time, if not the whole conflict. So that's a promising sign, if not too late. I mean, it's a little bit late, but good that it's happening now. Um, but in terms of ISIS more broadly, we're not going to be talking about a victory unless we accept that stabilization for all that it represents is an absolutely existentially necessary part of the mission. This is not just a, we beat the territory, we are all talking about numbers, right? So 99% of the territory... You're talking about the US therefore, position now. Yeah, 99% right. right. of the territory is retaken, therefore we've only got 1% of the way to go and then we've done. I mean, this is ridiculous. It's phase one of many um, phases of counterinsurgency. Look at what happened exactly. in Iraq, uh, you know, post-2010, but look at what's happening in Iraq now. now. We have declared victory in Iraq, and already ISIS is recovering. Right. In four different provinces, you've got major tribal leaders saying, I cannot control my town and my village at night. The ISIS comes in every single night. They issue night letters like the Taliban in Afghanistan. They are extorting every single local business. They have half of the police command on their paychecks. And this is what we've seen from ISIS before. And we've still got troops on the ground, right. um, let alone you know, the, domestic, the complicated political situation in Iraq. So if Iraq, Iraq has a legitimate central government, albeit one in some kind of a transition, um, and if it's that bad in Iraq, where we focused a lot more intensively than in Syria, then we need to be looking with real concern about Syria. Yep. And the DIA's in classified numbers were leaked or released to the press a couple of weeks ago. And frankly, I don't believe they're as big as they say. But 31,500 ISIS fighters, we think, still are active in Iraq and Syria. Now, as I say, I think those numbers are inflated. Right. But if they're even half that, if they're even half that, and we've already declared victory, um, we have an extremely long way to go before we can talk about an enduring victory, which is now, as we were talking about before, right. well, the official we, 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 title of our campaign. I just want to add something to this. So, so you, you had 1,000 ISIS fighters take to Crete. You had 1,600 ISIS fighters take Ramadi. Mm -hmm. You had 2,000 ISIS fighters take Fallujah. You had four to 6,000 ISIS fighters take Mosul. And they controlled that territory for almost three years. Uh, and, and to say that they're still there, and now you have all this infighting. And again, the reason I mention Iraq is ISIS sees Iraq and Syria as one battlefield. The Iranians see Iraq and Syria as one battlefield. Right. The United States sees them as two separately different battlefields. They see Syria as sectors where one policy east of the Euphrates, a different policy west of the Euphrates. And in that, you literally have to have ISIS looking around and saying, can you believe this? Mm -hmm. Everybody's focused elsewhere, and we're still here. Right. Exactly. I mean, I think it can't be 
it can't be stressed enough what he's saying is that we know what is going to happen. We know ISIS 2.0 is going to go is going to come. They're already it, there, right? Ex exactly. And and just pull, pulling out and declaring a victory. Victory. Uh, we know what's what's going to happen. It, it it would be really hard to pretend that we don't when it's so. In, in front of our face. So. We're getting ready to get into campaign season where we do these bumper stickers. Uh, Obama had al-Qaeda is defeated and right, Detroit right. is back. And uh, this administration seems to be saying the similar things with ISIS. ISIS is 99% defeated and the economy's back. But to have security backslide in 2018, 19, and 20 uh, would, would just continue this cycle. That's why I take heart with the addition of the language, as he's pointing out, uh, is that it used to be we were going to destroy or decimate ISIS, um, mm. but now it's the enduring defeat of yeah. ISIS, which means it's not just, all right, we take out that village or where we think they are, but we make sure that it doesn't return because we're smart enough, hopefully now, to realize right. what happens. Well, we, we started about nine minutes late, so we're gonna, we're gonna extend to 1.39 so we can take your questions, and uh, we're gonna open up the uh, panel to questions at this time. So what I'd ask you to do is identify yourself, wait for one of our interns to show up with a microphone, and, and, and please don't make uh, political statements. I'd like to hear some questions from the audience, uh, from our panelists. You can make a political statement, but have a question, and have that question be, uh, have, have it come up quickly. All right, any hands in the audience? This gentleman all the way in the back there in the white shirt, do not give him a microphone. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I am James Martone from Sky News Arabia. And just for Mr. Barabandi, initially we were talking about minorities, and I guess it was minorities supporting or seeing their salvation or their safety th through Assad, not in Assad. That's an interesting distinction, and I want to know what you meant by that. And then in, about the, the businessman and others whom should be sanctioned. What is the problem with getting them sanctioned? I mean, this government seems to be sanctioning right and left these days. So what is, what needs to be, you know, why, why isn't that happening in, in your opinions? Right. So for, for the minorities, um, as I told you, the, the way that started the war, the way that Assad said this war for his, his uh, constituent and for his people that this is Islamist, radical Islamist war. Unfortunately, other many countries who, in theory, try to support Assad, they play that games. I mean, the, you can see the red flags, you can see the Islamic slogans that hijack the revolution. Revolution was talking about human rights, transparency, democracy, civil society. And suddenly we talk about uh, Allah and uh, Islamic terms. And that fit very much with Assad narrative that these people are terrorists or they are extreme right-wing Islamists. So definitely by nature, the people who think they are non-Muslim, they will be feeling threatened by this kind of movement. And unfortunately, it has been it increased a little bit all over Syria in a way or other. Uh, that's why the people saw more that the Christian or the Alawite or other minorities that Assad is defeating us or defending us against this movement. But they are not stupid to know that he is killing everybody. In between, we couldn't find anyone from the opposition credible enough to tell these people that we are with you and this Assad is doing this. People know it, but on the day-to-day -day life, there is a killing. There is no rational. It's more emotional. It's more uh, instinct to survive. We end up today that uh, most of the Christians of Syria left Syria, from all Syria. Uh, we have many churches in Syria that are doing a lot of humanitarian aid. And to, just to keep the, the name of Christianity is in Syria, but as the number, most of them, they left. Uh, the Alawite, as I mentioned, uh, people attack the Alawite. They consider them, in general, they are part of the regime. And they have this hate relation or feeling toward them. I don't agree with that. They are just victims like us for this kind of regime. And on sanctions, I want. I mean, I mean, in terms of sanction, I think it takes some time to go from somebody coming on the radar of, you know, being in a lie of the regime, being uh, used as a vehicle to, uh, 
you know, get financial uh, revenues to the regime to the point of having the evidence and then sanctioning them. But also, if we look at 2012, 2013, <coughs> there were many pro-regime businessmen, you know, some of them even linked to Iran, who were not sanctioned. True. And one of the argument is that at some point, you need to have one, two, three, four, who are close allies to the regime, to have access to, in case you need some you know, contacts with the regime that have some room of deniability. And so uh, whether Samir Foz will fit within this spectrum of potential contacts with the regime that can be useful to Western interlocutor, I don't know. But as, as, as has been pointed out, uh, Samir is going to be, Samir Foz is going to be one of a list of names that are going to be deployed over time in order to have this, you know, contact, this, how to say, this, this access uh, of the regime to outside financial assistance that is not sanctioned. So the need is for diligence and continued activity on this front by people who would like to you know, make sure that the regime is denied access to reconstruction. Also, if I might add, the getting, uh, it is definitely an issue as to getting these people publicized so that our governments and the, and, the, and the EU will take note and then take action. And yes, it does take time. It would, it would be very helpful um, that when these stories are published that we get journalists who find this type of thing interesting and then publish those type of stories. We saw a recent, uh, Wall Street. yes, Wall Street. the Wall Street Journal Wall Street. profile, not exactly something that was casting him as the new oligarch, the new business oligarch the new face of the businessman of the Syrian elite. And we brought up earlier this, this BBC footage of Holmes, if we're talking about the same one, it's a footage that literally takes you through and completely whitewashes who caused the war, who caused the damage. It is literally presented in a, in a Western media outlet as like, it's Something a building's happened. bombed, you know, just, it, an earthquake. Yeah, it could it could have been an earthquake or, or something like that. People did this. We can hold them accountable, but those stories need to be found interesting and hopefully reported. So, so his lobbying firm is actually doing a great job here in DC, <laughs> based on what you said. I'm going to take three questions. I'm going to group them together. The Laurel will be one. This gentleman here, and this gentleman right here. I, and I'll take one question on this side. So four questions. Your questions. Your question first. You can just ask me, and then I'm going to write it down. Then we're going to put it to the panel. Okay. Um, yeah. The question, um, Lori Milroy, Kurdistan 24. Um, Bassa mentions about the Iranian forces surrounding the U.S. forces in Syria. I'd right. like to hear more about that, what okay. that involves. And second, Rhonda mentioned the Geneva Conference, the U.S. renewed commitment to the Geneva Conference, and then we never heard about it again. So my question is, how likely is that to be successful? Will it be relevant? Okay. All right, thank you. All right, and... Identify yourselves again, the, the next two people that I picked up. This gentleman right here. Hi, my name is Daniel. I'm a starting graduate school next week here in DC. Um, what are the chances of a post-Syrian conflict that does not have Assad in the leadership position? OK, thank you. Post-Syrian conflict. Million dollar question. Post-Syrian situation or post-Syrian conflict? Yeah. Syria without, us, without Assad? Yeah. OK. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dilmine Abdul Qadir, uh, director, uh, director of the Kurdistan Project at the Endama for Middle East Truth. Uh, my question is, Iran just signed a deal with uh, Syria, with the regime on a defense and uh, reconstruction uh, plan to stay there in, uh, for the future. Uh, what does that mean for the United States? Because uh, John Bolton recently stated that we will stay there as long as, before it was, as long as ISIS is there. Now it's uh, Iranian regular forces and militias as well. So would that mean that the United States would stay there in the north uh, for the future? Thank you. Okay, U.S. position. All right, and this gentleman right here. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Ibrahim. Uh, my question is, uh, you guys mentioned that the SDF might join the Syrian forces in t attacking Idlib, and uh, I was just wondering if something like that were to happen, would the U.S. potentially cut off a support for the SDF or maybe reconsider supporting them? I can answer that. Uh, as long as it takes place west of the Euphrates, we will not get involved. <laughs> uh, is that okay with the panel? <laughs> All right, so we have, we have four questions, and of course we'll expand on that. So the first question, Iranian forces uh, surrounding the U.S. forces in the north, 
And then I guess I'll pose a second question to you on the Geneva Convention, whether or not you think it'll be successful. Geneva process. Geneva process, yes. Uh, Ma'am, that's true. When you look at the, the map of Euphrates, you can see that the northern part is SDF and the American forces. We, we intentionally, we put the oil fields on the map because many of these main oil fields are protected by U.S. forces, special forces. It's, it's public information. Uh, it's less than 20 miles of them, the Iranian forces are there, or the pro-Iranian militias are there. And the question for us here, for me as a Syrian or for me as a person from that geographical area, that United States policy now is to encourage SDF to have some kind of communication or negotiation with the regime. That's fine. But that means that all this militia, pro-Iranian militia, they will get more fund, more money, be because of that kind of relation. The, the Assad regime want from that SDF in short term, they need the oil, the gas, electricity, and water. That means he will be better off if that deal wor works out. The more he is better off, the more the militia on the ground will be better off, the more these people will be able more to threaten United States forces, not to go across the river. And we saw this happening many times. So one of the recommendations that we always say that United States or should not encourage SDF to work with the regime, or the bottom line, United States should not allow the regime to benefit from the natural resources in that part. It should be protected for future Syria or whatever things we are talking about. Thank you. Look, for the Geneva process to succeed, it needs to rest on two pillars. The parties need to negotiate, and the party need to be credibly committed to sharing power as per Geneva as the final product. And so far, if we look at the Syrian regime behavior, it has shown not interested, not willing to negotiate with the opposition, and definitely not ready and not willing to share power under any circumstance. So my answer if, you know, will it succeed? No, because these are the two essential pillars for a Geneva process to succeed. And absent a total change in the regime attitude vis-a-vis -vis both accepting the opponent as a negotiating partner and sharing power with the opponent as part of the outcome of the negotiation process. I don't think it's going to succeed. And right now, we have two different visions, or maybe more than, but two principal visions. About. We have still the US paying lip service. We have all seen the readout from the conversation with Mr. Satterfield and uh, Mr. McGurk, what, two weeks ago, uh, about, about linking, you know, um, uh, the U.S. to a, a, a to the U.N. to certify to a certified political process right. according to U.N. standards and by the U.N. We have Dimistura, the Syrian envoy, the U.N. Syrian envoy, saying what Geneva is focusing on going forward is a constitutional committee and negotiation over the constitutional committee. And then you have Russia, which is very much saying. This is what Geneva about, because that has been decided in the Sochi meeting, which brought different Syrians together. And so Geneva should build on the decision of the Syrian intra-Syrian meeting in Sochi, which is to move forward with drafting a new constitution. This is where. So you have these different you know, uh, nat how to say objectives uh, for different parties. And you have one of the principal negotiating parties in Geneva who is not willing to negotiate and not willing to abide by any outcome of the negotiation. So how can it succeed? I just want to just tag on that with a two finger and just to say, from a deeply cynical perspective, answering the question depends on what we understand Geneva to be. And if yeah. we understand Geneva to be based on the Geneva communique, then it has zero chance of success. <laughs> if Geneva means what increasingly the UN and Russia think that it might be, then it might have more chances of success. Not even that. Well, I, 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 the Russians are clearly playing a game right now in trying to convince the rest of the international community that the conflict game is up, terrorism is on a down spiral, um, and we're now on the path to talking about stabilization, reconstruction, and a political settlement. And I'm not saying this is going to happen anytime soon, but I do think eventually that's going to show some success. It's quite notable that the US, the UK, Germany, France, Saudi, Jordan, and Egypt are about to go to Geneva to basically ratify the Constitutional Committee, which technically we've always said is a Russian ruse. But now we're basically turning up to the UN to say, yes, OK, this is acceptable. That you define what that, Geneva that is. That tells me we're on a slippery slope yeah. to an erosion of what Geneva is, and thus, potentially, 
in our worst case scenario, Geneva turning out to be a success, but from a Russian perspective, right. not from what we've traditionally well, understood Geneva well, to be. But, but, but if that's a scenario, you know, I mean, uh, uh, I, I really, I mean, will that basically lead to the political process that everybody seems to be, you know, pushing for? Including no, the Russians, it would be I don't an think so. It would be an externally imposed agreement. I, I, I don't think That's so. Yeah. Point. So basically, again, you are redefining Geneva, yes. you know, within yeah. the Russian lens, which I agree with you. And it all depends on how the Americans are going to keep sticking to, you know, Geneva exactly. being more than this definition. Now, if we come to that scenario where the Americans and the allies of the Syrian, uh, let, let's say, the non-Assad group uh, in, in in Syria. Uh, if they were to go down that slippery slope, I agree with you. I think it's, but it's not a success. No, no, of course. In not. terms For of Russia, ending the conflict, <laughs> I, in I terms of with ending the conflict, uh, in terms of resolving the conflict, <laughs> it's not a success. I disagree with both of you. We we'll have another panel on that to talk right. about in the future. <laughs> right. No, no, excellent. Uh, uh, we have two more questions, real quick. So, this Iran-Syria defense contract does that does that change the U.S. position? Will the U.S. stay in Syria because of that? I don't think so. I think we're looking for a defeat ISIS strategy, and we're looking for some way to mask Iran's presence there. And I think th there are strong arguments. The Russian argument is we were invited in by the Assad regime that the international community seems to be okay with. Iran is making the same argument. We were invited in by the Assad regime. Anybody I, I put it from different, I yes. agree with you, but different angles. I, I know as a fact there's so many countries approaching Assad to say, join us anti-Iran, and we, you will be fine. Financially, politically, everything. You will be fine. Just join us. Right. And that's from the Gulf, from European, and you name it, other countries. And that's not... Sounds like really, a good offer. It's a very good offer, but he always rejected. Right. Since long time. And I think, again, that the time of leaking with the time with visiting the defense minister to Iran, to, uh, of Iran to Syria, and announced that fact, it's part of counter-messaging to these countries that don't waste your time with Assad. We are here to stay. I, I make it message at counter message rather than to to make it more if the United States is staying or not staying. It's more ma Iranian message. Right. And is there a post Syria, post conflict without Syria without Assad? I don't. This is the time to get rid of Assad, and we're not doing it. So why would he go away in a post conflict? I mean, it's, Syria? it's long gone. I mean, right. there were like few, a couple of. T I think there were two times in this conflict <clears throat> cycle in 2013 where there was a possibility that Assad might fall after a US strike, if it was to be conducted. And at the time, even Assad's allies were worried about that scenario. And then there was, in two, summer 2015, pre-Russian intervention. This is when, again, the regime allies were throwing everything they had against the opposition and in order to shore up the regime prospects. And nothing was working, hence the Russian intervention. Basically, um, by regime allies, I meant the Iranians and Hezbollah. And hence, you know, the Russian came in because they knew without that intervention, especially the air intervention, the regime was going to fall. Since then, there's no longer opportunity for a Syria, at least for the foreseeable future, without Assad, militarily, you know? And politically, I don't see anybody rushing to remove Assad by politics. There's one other that we haven't looked at, one other way in which this would occur. Unlikely, but it still is simply a fact that I'm sure has been considered, is uh, the fact is, from Israel's perspective, since it is having to make its deals with Russia right now, it's up to Russia to enforce, uh, to the extent that it can or will, uh, what uh, to get Iran essentially out of the country. The big card that Israel has at the end is as difficult as it would be, would be if it managed to actually kill Assad, it would completely throw the entire Russian enterprise in Syria into question. Um, and that is a massive final card it could play, but would be in, in a, you know, one of those scenarios. Right, like, right break glass in clay case of it, it won't just fell by mistake Who right yeah. <laughs> just, I, i'm just saying that's the that's the, when we bond the chinese embassy really in kosovo <laughs> can, should be able to do things like that and the last question uh u.s cut off would, would the u.s cut off support to the sdf if the sdf participated on behalf of the regime in idlib uh, i think i think the united states position is they need the sdf 
east of the Euphrates, and they're having this very difficult messaging to the SDF east of the Euphrates when the SDF asked the Americans, why are you allowing our brothers and sisters to die west of the Euphrates? Uh, so I would think they would actually ignore what's happening in the West because they need that relationship in the East, and it's so it's being more and more difficult to maintain. That's true, because even Saleh Muslim, one of the head of SDF, he, he makes statement that we will join the Assad forces to liberate Afrin. Right. So that was such kind of statements. Uh, right. Two weeks ago, there was some joint attack from Assad SDF against some FSA areas in Afrin areas. So we, there's some indicators. I don't see it. It would be big. Right. You, I, I think you're right, Mike, as well, in saying that the U.S. needs the relationship. Um, there, there is, I believe, a somewhat of a reassessment over whether or not Arabs have enough representation in the East and whether or not it makes more sense to separate them from the SDF and have them as an autonomous pro-U.S. force in the East rather than from within the SDF focus more on keeping the Kurds in the Northeast and the Arabs, as simplified as that sounds, um, in, in Deir ez-Zor. Um, but we need the relationship with the SDF as a whole. We need the relationship with the YPG. And that shows now more than ever because there is concern in the U.S. government about the fact. So we've supported the idea, the prospect of SDC, SDF talks with Damascus but not, I don't think, at the pace at which they have gone over the last few weeks. And I think that's part of the reason why we've seen the meetings in Deir ez-Zor. It's part of the reason why Brett and Joel Rayburn went to Raqqa, mm. is to reassure our only real partner in Syria that we are here to stay, we are not leaving, you do not need to seek other avenues of long-term uh, potential, i.e. the regime. And so I think now more than ever, we wouldn't do anything. Though, on the other hand, we would see it with real concern. Um, we, Afrin was an issue for us. Right. Um, it was a real complicating issue with the Turks. Again, at a time where appointments in the State Department indicate that we are keen as the US government to separate our problems with Turkey from the Syrian issue. Um, and, and I think, again, now more than ever, that act from the SDF would really complicate um, our ability to, to do something like that. But also there is, in the end, you know, despite the great team that was put together at the State Department, despite what General Mattis, what General Dunford said yesterday, there's one person yep. whose opinion mm -hmm. is going right. to yeah. matter. And we have midterm elections coming up in November. We have a promise that was being made that we are going to get our troops out of Syria and Iraq. And whatever arguments have been offered to date about needing to continue the fight against ISIS, hence the enduring fight against ISIS might have won the day, but tomorrow? Who knows? Who knows? The bumper sticker has to work in 2020. Yeah, yeah. Right. so who knows? Okay. So who knows? So despite all the promises, you know, if I were a US official today going to meet with Syrian tribes and going to meet with SDF, I think I would not go too far in making these promises and, 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 and basically making right. this kind of enduring commitment. Right. There, there is one message we can continue to send to the Oval Office, which is one of your most prominent campaign statements Correct. on foreign policy Correct. when you ran for president Correct. was that Obama created Correct. ISIS by leaving Iraq too early. Right, exactly. Do you want to do exactly the same thing, if not worse, right. and create an even more powerful ISIS around? That's what is on the table right now. Yeah, exactly. and I, as far as I'm concerned, I hate, I hate the fact that it's so simplistic. So, that, to me, is the most effective argument to make sure. to prevent what all of his advisors want to avoid. Right, right, right. But in fact, this is the argument that has won the day until now. If yeah. Exactly, it is this argument that has won the day with the yeah. one person. Now, whether it's going to continue to win the day you know, tomorrow right. or the day after, who knows? But that's the argument. You're one right. of us needs to get on Fox and Friends and say that yeah, tomorrow. Exactly. <laughs> to okay, I, I appreciate everybody's patience and, and being staying later than the panel was supposed to last. Uh, thank you, panelists. You, you, were, you were incredible. Thanks for the education. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all for being here.